voices this morning and say you're the name of God. Jehovah, you are my refuge. 
God. You are my cornerstone. You are my deliverer. You are my helper. You are my shield, my buckler, my defense, my comfort, my helper, my healer, my sustainer, my refuge, my joy, my peace, my hope, my life, my strength, my peace, my joy, my life, my healer, my master, my savior, forever. There's nobody like you, God. One more time in my heart. Hallelujah. Come on, one last time in my heart. My heart will sing. Hungry. Hungry. There's nobody like you, Lord. Nobody greater, God. Forever. Forever, right? I'll sing of your love, God. I'll sing of your goodness. Because there's nobody like you. There is nobody stronger. There is nobody greater than you are from God. And my heart will sing. Forever will sing. There's nobody like you. You reign with more power and authority. And my heart will sing. And my heart will sing. can't make no deposit, amen? But whatever you put in is what you're going to get out. How many know when we talk about honor, it is more than just a person, a leader? When we talk about honoring God, there's so many different facets that comes into honoring God. And I mean, our worship is one of the signs or one of the ways that we honor God. Our time, our giving, Uh, All of that contributes to how we honor him. And so I believe that uh, when we're worshiping, we should go all out and shouldn't hold anything back. There are different Hebrew words, and I won't go into those uh, for worship. But uh, you need to do a word study on on, uh, worship. I mean, you just need to study what each phrase means. And uh, they all mean to go all out for God. That's why David was a radical worshiper, because he reflected on how good God had been to him and delivering him from the sheepfold to the kingdom. And some of you, you know you're better now than you ever been. You, 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 I don't care how this season has been, you know you're better than you ever been. You know you're living better, you're driving better. You eating better, you got more money than you ever had. God has been good to you. And so he has been better to us than sometimes our praise indicates. But I'm not up here to make you praise because you can't make nobody praise. Because what's in a person is what's going to come out. But I just want you to do a reflection of when you told God if he did certain things, you would be grateful. And he did that and some. I I just think we forget sometimes. I I just think you forget when you were in that little apartment and and your neighbor had roaches. You didn't, but, um, you know. When you was driving that, that hoop there and praying that you made it from A to B. Yeah. 
when you didn't have but a couple outfits and you wasn't much of a choice. You grabbed one or the other. But now, you got a choice. When you didn't have a job and then God bless you with a job. He's been better to us than we've been to ourselves. I remember when I came back to the Lord, I just had some, some, some jeans and a shirt and some shoes, and I was faithful. I was in there like I had a three-piece suit on. But the Lord began to reward my faithfulness. And now I can wear what I want to wear, dress like I want to dress. But it hadn't always been like that. It's because he's been good. You can be seated. I, I just want you to have a flashback. I know we get amnesia sometimes, but I just want you to remember when you was eating at McDonald's, not because that was your favorite restaurant. That was because a Big Mac was like a steak to you. I don't want the church to become ungrateful. Because I told you that the word worship comes from an old Latin word, worship, and it means to ascribe worth to something. And so it is hard to worship God if we have not ascribed the proper worth to God, if we have not properly assessed God. It's hard to really worship him. Okay, let me... Um, Listen, we, today is um, Vision 2020, right? Yeah. Now, now, hold on, don't clap. I'm excited, too. I'm excited. Listen, um, some of you never stretched to the $1,000 level. Some, some of you, this was your first time committing and giving $1,000 to the church. And the $1,000 seed is the seed that breaks the back of poverty. Those that have sown they understand what I'm saying. It, it is just something that shifts in your life when you give a thousand dollar seed. I don't understand it. I, I, I'm not the author of it. I don't know, but I know when you sow a thousand dollars, the back of poverty is broken in your life. And so you can, you can do one or two things. You can be obedient to God and sow it and get the back of poverty broken off your life, or you can just keep hoping and praying that one day you get your breakthrough. Sometimes breakthroughs are intentional. Because how many know there are three lands? And, and Mrs. Jamel is going to do the offer. I'm just, I'm just talking what I hear. There are three lands. The land of not enough, the land of just enough, and then the land of more than enough. How many know it's God's desire for us to be in the land of more than enough? Why is that? Because anything else would be selfish. Because if I don't have more than enough, I can't help anybody. And God's heart is always for us not only to be blessed, but to be a blessing. He said that I will bless you to be a blessing. And so it is hard to be a blessing when we're always crying for a blessing. And so the, the mature believer understand that maybe God got you out of the land of not enough. And maybe you're in the land of just enough. But you should not desire to stay in the land of just enough. Your desire should be to get to the land of more than enough. But there are certain principles that govern moving into that land. It doesn't happen just because God loves us. How many know God loved the children of Israel? But none of them entered into Canaan but Joshua and Caleb and those that were a certain age. Because it takes a certain mindset to go into Canaan. And some people just don't have it. We have it for other stuff. We just haven't, it haven't quite clicked when it comes to the kingdom of God. You know, we were in the mall yesterday and man, they were out there just shopping, just shopping. Just, um, I didn't, none of them stores interested me in that particular mall, but they was out there just shopping. And I was like, man, people have money. 
people have money. It's just they, they have it for what they want to have it for. It's not that money is the, is the issue. It's the priority. And with that being said, let us get into our lesson. You Hold your Bible up because I need to relax you. I need to bring you back down. And some of you was getting offended in your heart. Say, this is my Bible. I have what it says I can have. I can do what it says I can do. It is inerrant, infallible, incorruptible. Today, I will be taught the word of God that will go into the soul of my heart and produce not 30, not 60, but 100 fold. I decree my mind is attentive. My heart is receptive. I shall, I must, I will be changed in Jesus' name. Now, if you believe that, praise him. Now, today we're talking about the necessity of focus, part four. The necessity of focus, part four. Let me just do a quick review since it's been a couple of weeks since I was up before you. Uh, we said that there are four ways to see where do we get our vision or our objective from. We said the word, dreams, prophecy, vision, right? Then we said focus requires vision. Proverbs 29, 18, where there is no vision, the people perish, right? Paul said he pressed toward what? The vision, the goal, the objective. And then we talked about some other things. Then we started talking about focus requires prioritizing to be accomplished. Say focus requires prioritizing to be accomplished. And so we discussed Matthew 6.33. I did expositor, uh, expository teaching on that um, about seeking first the proton, the kingdom of God, and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Then we went to Matthew 6.24. You can't serve two masters. You can't serve God and mammon or God and money. You can't serve God and this system. You have to make a decision, and Jesus said the way that we test where our heart is is where our treasure is. Is that not what he said? So I'm not getting into that. Take that up with him. And then we uh, concluded last time, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. We're talking about focus requires prioritizing to be accomplished. Let's go back over to Hebrews since that's where we concluded uh, it's a good scripture to read again. Hebrews 12 and 1, reading from the Tree of Life version. Hebrews 12 and 1, when you get there, say, I have it. I have it. This is the right of Hebrews. He says, therefore, since we have such a great cloud of witnesses, we discussed who that cloud was last time, surrounding us, let us also get rid of every weight and entangling sin. Let us also get rid of every weight and entangling sin. Why? Because weights will weigh you down and weights will become sin if you do not get rid of them. How is that possible? Well, a weight is a result of worry. Usually people get weighty because of worry. Is that not true? Yeah. Worry is a sin because the Bible says uh, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So if I'm casting out off weights and sin, that means that weights may not necessarily be sin right now, but it will morph into sin and it will begin to affect my focus. How many know stuff that weigh you down break your focus? Let's just, can we just be honest today? Anybody ever been under so much weight that it was hard for you to focus? That could have been weight about a loved one, weight about a bill or a situation. It just began to put so much weight on you, it was even hard to pray. So you know if it's hard to pray, it's hard to focus. And so the writer is saying, we got to cast off the weights and the sin that is so easily uh, that entangles us, right? Okay, get rid of every weight and entangling sin. Let us run with endurance the race set before us. So weights and entangling sin prohibit me from running my race. 
it, you know, when you're training for like to be a fireman or uh, law enforcement, uh, BLET, basic law enforcement training, you have to run with a, a bag over your shoulder like a person. It has to be a heavy bag because they have to know that you can still make this time with weight on you. You got to be able to pull this person out of the fire and carry them. You, so we can't just let you run the drills just by yourself. We got to see how much weight you can handle. Now, that's good if I am applying for law enforcement or to be a fireman or military. But when I am walking this Christian walk, running this race that he is talking about, he said, I got to cast off the weights and the sins that entangle me because they will restrict me from running my race. You don't want to go on the track and run the 50-yard dash and have, um, have punching bags on your shoulders. You're, going, you're guaranteed to lose because weight slow you down. Now, we know that this race that we're in is not a sprint. It's a marathon, but it will have you so fatigued that you will not finish. And there are a lot of people in the kingdom that are not even on the track anymore because they have allowed the weights of life and entangling sin to break their focus and to stop their stride. So what? My purpose and the vision that God has given me is no longer a priority in my life. Now I am more focused on the weight, focusing on the entangling sin. Doubt is sin, y'all. I know we don't want to hear it. That's why you got to spend time building yourself up on your most holy faith. Jude, um, um, only one chapter, verse 20. Why? Because whatsoever is not a faith is sin. When we're sitting around worrying and depressed all the time, man, that is sin. And that is something that will break your, your focus and cause you to get your priorities twisted and not run the race that is set before you. How many people focus got broken this year because of COVID? You think this is the first time that a, 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 a pandemic has hit the world? You think this is the first time that America has had to go through something? So there were believers in every season. And I'm sure in every season that something happened, there were some believers that got in fear, got in doubt, but there were some that said faith is for a fight. This is how I tell how much faith I have. This is the acid test of faith. Okay. How do you know you have faith if it does not have a challenge or opposition? That's like, how do you know that you lifting your little dumbbells every day really working unless you have some resistance? You, it, that's, that's how you build muscle is by resistance. But you don't know if you're as strong as you think you are until you put it to the test. You walking and you feeling good about yourself? Well, let Sister Latifah take you to Crowder's Mountain. Let's see how much stamina you really have. Not getting help up in here. Yeah, you can walk your neighborhood, no hills. No valleys. Just smooth. You're just striving through there. Let, let's put what you've been working on to a test. And what has happened, this season has presented a test to America, but even a bigger test to the church. Because do we have the faith we brag on, or have we been entangled by this sin of worry and doubt, and we are weighed down, and we can no longer continue the process of running our race? Some people say, get off of that. Get off my street, apostle. I'm going to get off. I'm going to let you keep walking your street. How do you do that, apostle? That sounds easier said than done. No, it's, he tells us in verse 2. He said, focusing on Yeshua, focusing on Jesus, the initiator, he started it, and the perfecter of faith. So he is the, he is the initiator, right? He is the author. And he is the finisher of our faith. But we have to focus on him and not Corona. So, so many people have fallen out in this lovely season. And um, they've fallen out because they're focusing on people instead of focusing on Yeshua. Let, let me help you out. Trump is not the Savior. Biden sure heck ain't the Savior. 
Obama was not the Savior. Cooper is not the Savior. Yeshua was the Savior. And when I start focusing on people and parties more than I focus on him, I'm weighed down. Do you realize there are some people, family, disowning them? I just heard this guy, he real famous uh, celeb, well, um, I guess he's a celebrity. He's he been on, on news. Now. And, and his daddy disowned him because he supports Trump. His father disowned him. How, my thing is, focusing on Jesus, the author and the finisher of my faith. How do you disown somebody because they made a choice that's theirs? How do you disown family because they have an opinion that is different from yours? We as a, a society have stooped to the very lowest levels of stupidity and bigotry. But when you get your attention off of him and you start putting it on them, that's when you start getting weighed down. That's when sins develop. Okay. Focusing on Yeshua, the initiate and perfecter of our faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross dis disregarding its shame, and he has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. We have to keep our attention on him. When we're talking about focus, there is a vision there is a purpose, there is a mandate that he has given us, but it is still in him. How many know it's in him? If he's the author and the finisher of our faith, that means it begins with him, it has to flow in him, and it has to end with him. And so when we take our eyes off of him, we begin to get bogged down by the cares of this world. And the weights, the, the weights, the sins that, that entangle us and to keep, when you're entangled, you can't get out. Think about an animal that gets in a, in a brush or, or a trap and they're trying to get free. They can't. They stuck. That's how Abram had the, uh, Abraham had the, the ram that was stuck in the thicket. It, it was entrapped. It was entangled. And that's what happened when we start focusing on stuff and people more than focusing on him. We end up being entangled and we cannot move forward. So that means our progress has stopped. Why do you want to just live life existing and never progressing? Who, that's a fool that does not want to progress in life. A bigger fool that does not want to progress in God. Some people are just stuck. But God is about taking us from faith to faith and glory to glory. God is about progression. It's not his desire for you to be at the same place that he found you. And let me just deal with this, and then I'll get off of this uh, scripture here. But we're talking about focus requires prioritizing to be accomplished. Listen, success is not how big your house is. People, we call that keeping up with the Joneses. Success is not the logo that is on your, 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 your depreciating steel. Okay, I'm not getting help up in here. Success is not the, the, the $500 gators that you have on. That's nothing wrong with that. Or, or, or the designer that you have on your back. That's not success. Or, or how many figures you make on your job, which they can come in there any day and give you a slip. That's not success. See, we equate success with what the world sees. And, and the Bible tells us that if we meditate on the word day and night, that we will have good success and our ways will be made prosperous. But success is accomplishing God's will for your life. So let me help you out. I don't care if you have a seven-figure job. I don't care if you have a seven-figure job. I don't care if you, you have a Rolls Royce and you're being chauffeured everywhere. I don't care if you have a 20,000-square-foot house. I don't care if you have St. John, Louis Vuitton, Gucci. I don't care. None of that matters if you're out of the will of God. Success to a believer is fulfilling the will of God. And, 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 and see, this is the thing. There were two brothers that they, their father had died, and they, they, they were fighting over the inheritance. People something else. 
And they, one came to Yeshua and said, uh, make him give me my stuff. And then Jesus said something very interesting. He said, a man's life does not consist in the abundance of things. Don't get things confused with your life. Things enhance your life, but don't get things confused with being your life. And some of us think we're successful because of what we drive, what we wear, how much money we make or the size house we live in, and that does not make you successful being in God's perfect will for your life and success. Most people focus are broken because it has been displaced from him to them. I can't get help. They're no longer looking at God's plan. They're looking at their plan. And I'll tell you when you're off, when you no longer even consult God, about your plan, you just do stuff and ask him to bless it. You making major moves and haven't even consulted God, and God know you're getting laid off in six months. I'm not getting help. You ain't even asked God's opinion, Lord, should I do this? Because you have become the focus. See, the apostle said we shouldn't be one. No, I ain't lying. Don't lie on me. I like nice stuff. I have nice stuff, but it doesn't have me. And I'm not a success because of how much my ring costs or, or, or how much money I got in the bank. I'm a success because I'm in his will. That stuff don't define me. That is for my pleasure, not my identity. We're trying to let stuff define us. No, he defines me. Because, you know, I was in the church, Sister Potts, where, where it was said, if you don't have this stuff, you ain't anointed. And I was doing the best I could to take care of my little family and make sure our light stayed on and that we paid the rent at the apartment. And I was being thrown off on because I had not bought my wife a house yet. Granted, we was in our 20s. So I, I, I heard the philosophy that God ain't using you if you don't have the stuff. But I saw he was using me more than the people that had the stuff. That's why I'm telling you, stuff should not define you. It should enhance you. Don't let stuff become your identity. Because if you do, it will break your focus and you will no longer try to impress him. You'll try to impress them. Do you know how many people buy outfits to wear to certain functions and they're going to take it back just to impress people? Put some tape under there because I'm going to take this back. Oh, y'all think I don't know the games people play. Put some tape on the bottom of them shoes because they're going back. Why, why do people do that? Your, that has become your identity. Not enhancing you. That has become your identity. See, I was good when I was wearing black suede from Avon. It still smells good. Oh, y'all like, I, be, I was in high school. They'd be like, you smell good. What you got on black suede? Old Spice, Brute 33. These young people don't know nothing about that stuff. The look alone and the look calls. I'm going to tell my age. So. But, but see, some people feel like what you possess is who you are. No, I'm who he, I'm who he says I am. You know, my, me and my wife, we were joking, get ready for church this morning. She was like, you know, some people said this and they said that. She said, I can't understand that. I said, well, it ain't what people call you. It's who you answer to. Because people call you a lot of stuff, but what, who do you answer to? Because if you don't call me son, I'm not paying attention to nothing else you got to say. I am first a son of God. Let me get off of this. I've lost some people. What, what he thinks matters more than anybody. 
audience of one. Okay, let me, let me get deeper into this. Go over to um, Luke chapter 9, verse 62. Am I helping anybody? Yeah. You shop at the Goodwill, people be like you. You remember you used to shop there too. Ain't nothing wrong with shopping at the Goodwill. There'll be some good stuff at the Goodwill. My grandma raised me in the Goodwill. The thrift store. Now I go in there because I want to, looking for golf clothes, but I mean it ain't because I got to. Don't, 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 how can I balance this? Don't get false humility and make low level living acceptable either. Ain't nothing wrong with going in Goodwill. That's some good stuff. You might find a lure or something in the Goodwill. Ain't nothing wrong with that. But, but don't, don't, make that, don't make that acceptable. Do it because that's what you want to do, not because that's what you got to do. Y'all not talking. And, and you got the athletes and the hoes and the Joes up in the store spending big money, and you're going to tell me the ch- children of God got to go to the Goodwill. No, the, the devil is a lie. See, sometimes we can get that false humility. That's why I just go to the little thrift stores. I don't even go in the big department stores and stuff. See, that ain't glorifying God either. That might make you feel some kind of way. But I'm saying let that be because that's what you want to do, not because you have to do it. Nothing wrong if you like a, I like a good Whopper. Even the Impossible Whopper is good. Okay, I can't get help. Anybody like a good Whopper every now and then? Nothing wrong with them because it tastes like it came off the grill. Oh, y'all ain't going to be honest. Even the Chicken Whopper is good. But don't, don't, oh yeah, me see Apostle like McDonald's. Now hold up now. I like lobster and shrimp too, and crab legs. Uh, uh, Burger King, let me, get my, let me get my stores right. Apostle, yeah, I, I like every now and then, but I mean, I go get a Whopper because I got a taste for it, not because that's the only thing I can afford. I'm not going to get in this false humility and see all the church need to do is just start eating McDonald's and, and just um, get your Big Mac from Burger King and, and get your um, Baconator from Wendy's and get your four for four. No, get a four for four because you want a four for four. I'm not getting help up in here. That false humility. False humility. How is that glorifying anybody? Because every time we go in goodwill, you, you, we can't see nothing but your feet because you done died head first in the box. <laughs> Let me get off of that. We, we can't see nothing but your feet. You done died head first. Living in that box. Nothing wrong with that. If you go because you want to. But you should be able to go in another store and afford something. I remember, remember I taught y'all about God and your money. And I told you one of the signs of poverty is always talking about what other people are doing with their money. Tamara be talking about damn Frisco's. How she be going out there today? That's a sign of poverty. Because you don't know what she got. You can't make people's situation your situation. Because some people never do certain things. Some people have never bought some perfume over $20. I've never bought that stuff there, $110 for that. We don't knock the person that does it. How they spend $100 on some stuff that just go on your body? Well, I want my body to smell good. And I don't want it to disappear when the first wind blows. <laughs> No, you know what I'm talking about, don't you? <laughs> uh, yeah. 
Now, if I want to get some black suede, I get some black suede. But it ain't because I got to, it's because I like it. If I want to get Prada, I get Prada. If I want to get Vince Camuto, I get Vince Camuto. Versace, I get what I want to get. So, so don't box people in. Because you done accepted that false humility. And you weighed down. Your focus broken. Now you, you got you to gotta beat people being humble. That's pride. Isn't it amazing that somebody could be lowly and prideful? Say, I know I'm right with the Lord because see all that, that lavish stuff. No, you prideful because now you're judging other people. You run your race. You know Junior was fast. Junior, junior high school, well, middle school, high school, he was always on the fastest on team, relay team. Junior was a, a sprinter like I was when I was younger. But you know what ended his career? Running on the track at Hunter Huss that they couldn't race on because it, was, it looked like asphalt that would have tracked the track. It had holes and stuff in it. And they out there practicing, and he hit a curve and twisted his ankle and never got his ankle back right to run at the level he was running at because it was an inferior surface that he was running on. Some people are happy with inferior places in their life. And if you get comfortable hanging out in inferior places, it will cripple you to your assignment and your destiny. Now, I'm going to get off of that. I'm going to get off of that. That false humility, that's pride. Don't nobody pray as much as I pray. And don't nobody fast like I have pride. Don't nobody know the Bible like I know the Bible. Prideful. Talking about kingdom stuff, but it's prideful. Okay, 62. 9 and 62. <laughs> but Yeshua said to him, no one who has put his hand to the plow and look back is fit for the kingdom of God. We're talking about focus. Yeshua said, because you know all these guys was coming up to, to Yeshua like, uh, let me follow you and let me do this. And he said, well, do this. And he's like, oh, everybody had an excuse. Everybody had an excuse why they couldn't follow him at that time. See, people want to follow him, but on their terms. And so this last dude, uh, he wanted to follow him. And, and then when Yeshua said, okay, well, well um, you go and preach again. And he was like, well, first let me go home and bury my father. But his father hadn't died. He wanted to go hang out and didn't know when the expiration date would be. And then I guess Yeshua had had enough. He said, any man that put his hand to the plow. Listen, something caught me in this text because he didn't say let go. He said, look back. Any man that put his hand to the work and get his focus broken by looking back at something that has become the priority and no longer what I told you to do is the priority. He said, you're not, oh God. He said, you look back, it's not fit for the kingdom. People that look back, people that are easily um, moved and their focus is easily broken, you're not fit for the kingdom. You're not fit. Now, Yeshua said, I didn't say this. How many people have put their hands to the plow but have started looking back being distracted and no longer consider his objective, his purpose, his mandate, the priority in their lives? Because if you're going to finish strong, you're going to have to have the ability to keep it moving even when all hell breaking loose. When everything that can happen is going on around you, you're going to still have to have the ability to keep it moving. Well, my spouse acting, God, he, he, he knew your spouse was crazy before you married him. I can't let my focus get broken because my spouse is distracted. Well, my job talking about, oh, I can't let my focus get broken because what might happen? This is going to happen. Oh, yeah, it's happening. This is going to happen. That might happen. I told y'all when you worry, you're paying for the future with your today's currency. 
He said, if you put your hand to the work and you look back, you're not fit for the kingdom. You sure consider the kingdom the priority. What do we consider the priority? Not getting too much help. People don't like teaching like this because it started messing with their idols. Because you know we have idols in the church. And when you start talking about priority, it locates people's heart. Put the pulse on where they are. I'm just, don't shoot the messenger. I'm just the messenger. Every believer has to go through evaluation, has to do inventory, and make sure he's still the priority. Okay. So to, um, so to, no one can follow Jesus, so to, no one can follow Jesus without making him the absolute and exclusive center of life. Say it again. No one can follow Jesus without making him the absolute and exclusive center of life. Only you can answer that. I mean, I can answer it. Because you can look at people. You don't have to look too hard to see who has made him the center of their life. Behaviors prove it. Desires prove it. Commitment proves it. Faithfulness proves it. Um, attention to kingdom details proves it. It's a whole lot of tests that, that you can just observe by just observing people. You don't have to interview them. You don't have to say anything to them. You can look at the people and tell who God and his kingdom is the absolute priority in their lives. God, this is so... You, you don't need to go in the spirit. I don't have to go in the spirit. I, I, look, at, I look at behavior. Let me, let me ask you a question. Anybody here like seafood? That's the most of the church, right? Wow, that's, that's 99%. So... Um, now, let me try this. Who don't like seafood? So nobody, right? So 100% of the people here like seafood. Okay, praise the Lord. I knew I like y'all for some reason. Okay. <laughs> Listen, you don't have to go in the spirit to see who likes seafood. They post it. They talk about it. They tell you I'm going to get some seafood after I leave church. It, 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 you, it, you know it's part. They display it. You get close enough, they might smell like a lobster. Yeah, you, 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 it's in them. It's in their DNA. I ain't getting no help up in here. You, you observe. You talk, where are you going out? Oh, we going over here. To the, you know. Behavior tells you what they like. Well, you look at people's behavior in the kingdom, and it will tell you if he is the absolute priority in their life. Conduct always exposes closeness. My conduct for the kingdom exposes how close I am to the king. He's the priority. Everything revolves around him. He's the priority. That, that, that's, that's, you, you talk to me, I could talk other stuff, but at the center of it, you're going to get Jesus. People meet us, you know, at, at the end it, you're going to get Jesus. <laughs> Why? He's my priority. Why? I'm leaving my car here. I'm leaving my house here. I'm leaving my jewelry here. I'm leaving every watch I got here. I'm leaving my money here. I'm leaving everything I have here. I can't take it with me. So why would I worship tangible stuff that I'm going to leave for somebody else to enjoy? I'm not going to get help. He's the priority. Look at their check ledger. Needless markup or his kingdom. Natural things show where our priority is. Not because you got that Dagon on the back of your car. <laughs> Y'all remember Wednesday? <laughs> Not because you got your little fish on the back of your car with the cross in it. Priorities. 
So he must be the absolute and exclusive center of life. Absolute. No, no, nothing else should bump him out the way. See, I, I'll make a tea time to play golf. And if something come up, I call him and say, listen, I got to cancel, cancel my tea time. I don't want to... I don't want to occupy that time and somebody else can use it. I'll bump a tea time. I have lunch scheduled somebody. I'm like, something came up. Can we reschedule this? I'll bump that. I'll bump a speech engagement or slap, turn it down. I don't accept everything come my way. But I'll never bump him. He's going to stay the head, the center. I'll never bump him. And there's too many people too comfortable bumping him. Let me mark through this Jesus another day. Okay. We, we talking about focus, right? He is our focus. I got to get off that scripture, Lord, because it got, it got silent for the space of 30 minutes. Go to Acts 7.39. Focus requires prioritizing to be accomplished. It requires prioritizing. Anybody has ever accomplished anything, it was because they were focused. And that's not just biblical. That's, that's anything that a person accomplishes. It's a golfer named uh, DeChambeau. And this dude was like, this dude was like Minister Kenny size a year ago. But during the pandemic, he committed to certain eating habits, certain uh, exercise routine. He came back to the next tournament when they were able to play looking like the Incredible Hulk. This dude so swole, he hits. Listen, there are, are 400 yard holes that usually you hit a shot and then a second shot. This dude is driving the green. 400 yards. And the, the broadcasters love it. They was like, man, what he did is phenomenal. They like, whole, he won the U.S. Open because he outdrove everybody. Well, that's how Tiger Woods did in his heyday. He, he swole up not this big. But he was out driving everybody else, hitting it far. This dude hits the ball a mile. And now other golfers talking about they getting ready to get on board. <laughs> what happened? He dedicated his focus to his craft, to the changing of his physique, and how he swings the golf club to give him success. Athletes will, will gain weight, lose weight. They hit thousands of balls a day. They practice. They put the work in. I'm amazed how many other people besides the church put the work in to excel in what they do. Here we are in the church and want to excel because we got a good heart. I want to teach apostle on my heart, right? But you don't know nothing. Your heart ain't what we gonna hear. What's in your head that's coming out? You gonna put the work in to study, to master your craft, because you don't have the focus. See, focus requires discipline. Focus requires discipline. You, you, most people simply don't have the discipline. How many know ADD is a is a real thing? I was looking at the kids, Sister Breela, and like, man, they really struggle. But then I started looking at the parents. I said, that's why. The parents can't pay attention. The parents can't stay with you for an hour. And I know if the parents ain't got the ability to focus, the kids ain't got it. Why can't we focus? Priority. Because we can sit in a movie for two hours. We can have a conversation for hours. We can take a, a trip for hours. We can do everything we want to do. But we can't focus on, our, on the word. We can't focus on the purpose that he has for our lives. I'm about finished. Verse 39, Acts 7. Listen to what they say. They say, our fathers did not want to be obedient to him. They, that's what they're talking about. They're talking about when Moses had all them people talking that train. They say, our fathers did not want to be obedient to him, talking about God, but shoved him aside. 
How many people today showed him a sign? And in their hearts, they turned back to Egypt. That, listen, y'all, I added this yesterday. They didn't physically go back to Egypt, but in their hearts, they turned. They pushed God's agenda aside, and in their hearts, they turned back to Egypt. Even though they were not physically in Egypt, their hearts were there. And wherever, wherever your heart is, that's where your loyalty is. So they could not be loyal to God because their hearts turned back to Egypt. What has the church heart turned back to that has broken their focus? I love how he said, he said they pushed God aside. And in their hearts, they turned back to Egypt. Meaning we're not trying to hear what God is saying. We're not trying to do what he wants us to do. We had it better in Egypt. Egypt had no requirement, just abuse. Y'all, some of y'all wake up next week and get that. Egypt didn't have a requirement, they had abuse. Make these bricks or get beat. God had requirement. You can't serve me in the kind of way. So in their heart, they turn back to Egypt because even though we're being beat to death, it's better than some requirements. Because focus is going to require something. Focus is going to require discipline. And it is going to require a greater commitment to God's word, to a life of prayer. Ha, ha, listen, I'm amazed how many people will drive days to get a prophetic word. I'm going to hear that prophet day in time. But we got 66 books of the word of God. We have a sure word of prophecy. The testimony of Jesus is, is the spirit of prophecy. But we'll go hear a person prophesying because we won't get in the book. I'm amazed how many people, I want to speak for God, the will of God. Well, you, you never got to know his will. You never got to know his mind. His mind is his will. His will is his word. You want to be a representative of the company and you have not read the manual. I want to be used of God. No, you don't. You want to perform. Because if you want to be used of God, you will put the time and work in to be with him. A desire to preach without a desire to study is a desire to perform. I can't. I'm about to quit. <laughs> Should it be lobster today? That's right. I'm about to quit. A desire to do anything for God without a desire to study and spend time with God is a desire to perform. So in their hearts, they turn back to Egypt, to the world. We may not be turning back to Egypt, but what are we turning back to to break our focus? We just have a desire. <laughs> it, I'm trying to, to, to fathom this. You were getting beat down, the sun baking on you. Somebody telling you <laughs> what to do. If you didn't do it, you would kill. But yet you equated that better than the love God has you for you. And because God is trying to get Egypt out of you. You left Egypt, but Egypt never left you. Some people left the world, but the world never left them. Their mind is still full of the world. And it goes back to actions and behaviors and conversations reveal that Egypt is still there. Oh, that slipped out, Apostle. No, that ain't slip out. That's there. You ain't just slipping cuss. You a cursor. I just messed around in here. I don't know what happened. You, you ain't mess around. You an abuser. You are an abuser. That ain't just something came out. That's you. Hallelujah. 
Go to, Ecclesi- <laughs> Go to Ecclesiastes chapter 9. I'm going to keep it moving. I'm just going to teach you today. I'm talking about prioritizing. Focus requires prioritizing to be accomplished. Ecclesiastes 9 and 10. Verse 10 uh, reads, whatever, say whatever. whatever, whatever your hands find to do, do with your, with your all strength, for there is no work or planning or knowledge or wisdom in Sheol where you are going. Now the King James says in the grave, this say in hell, but I ain't going to hell. But what is the writer saying? The writer is saying whatever your hands find to do. Do with your all strength. I don't know why he worded it like that, with your all strength. I would say with all your strength. For there is no work or planning or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you're going. How many know if the rapture doesn't take place, we're all going to the grave? We got to leave here one day. I don't care how much you try to preserve your life. Uh, Michael Jackson was laid up in in the hyperbaric chamber and wore a mask before corona hit. Did he not? But he's still left here. We all got to leave here. What he's saying? He's saying whatever you're supposed to be doing, he's saying do it with everything that's in you. Because when you die, there is no wisdom. There is no plan. You can't do it when you're gone. You have to do it while you're here. And there are too many people that act like they got a lot of time. Listen. I'm going to read the next scripture before I, before I elaborate further. Go to Colossians. This is a, um, a sister scripture that Colossians 3 and 23, because I think it makes more sense how Apostle Paul said it in Colossians. Colossians chapter 3, verse 23. Are you there? Whatever. Start off just like the last one, right? Whatever you do, say what I do. Yes. Listen to what he said. Work at it from the so, another translation says what? Whatever you do, do what? With all your might, okay? So this say, edit from the soul, the regular translation say, with all your might, as for the Lord, and not for people. For you know that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as a reward. It is to the Lord Messiah, you are giving service. So whatever we do, we're supposed to do it with, with everything in us as unto the Lord. Why? Because it is the Lord that is going to repay. That means if I ask you to pick up some paper, not you don't do it like you ask your kids to wash dishes and they have doing it. Like, no, he said whatever we do, We're to do it with all our soul. That means your your total being as unto the Lord because he's the one that's going to repay us. If we really believe that, Sister Adrian, why do the church, why do we so haphazardly handle God's business? I say go out there and pick some paper up. Mm -hmm. You done missed the whole. You ain't doing that unto the Lord. You're doing that conveniently to you. We got some sisters after y'all stand around and talk and leave, they'll be in here cleaning up. Them sisters be putting us hurting on this church. I love to see them clean. I say, boy, I feel so clean when I see them clean. I say, the church is clean. Jesus could come and sit on the toilet up in here. It is clean. Doing it with all their heart. As unto the Lord. Do do we do everything that we do as unto the Lord? Or do we just, nah, I can't get help. Love but Brother Mark and uh, Marlon out there parking them car. You get on my nerves sometimes, but I love them. (laughs) Apostle. I like I know I'm straight. Now, what is he doing? I love you, brother Mom. Just joking. What is he doing? He's doing it wholeheartedly. He's passionate about it. 
I can't even imagine when we get it paved and the lines on, he's going to be on another level out there. He, he might have on this little air, airline uniform out there, air traffic controller. <laughs> hey, but he's passionate. He has been known to come and get some of y'all out and like, you ain't park right. Come out here and move it. Get it right. I, I love the passion. Because he's doing it wholeheartedly as unto the Lord. Not just for man, but unto the Lord. Everything we do is for the Lord, unto the Lord. We act like it's for a man. No, it's for God. And when you're doing it for the Lord, with everything in you, you refuse to allow your focus to be broken. God, not like your boss. You'll be cutting corners. No, he see. And let me just help you out. Some people just miss the obvious. God is a very good rewarder. He is a great Because re- we read, oh, he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Okay, that don't just mean you're going in your prayer closet. Diligently seeking him is seeking for his kingdom to advance. And to advance with excellence. And whatever part I have to play for that to happen, then I'm going to seek him in it. I'm telling y'all, most people are disqualified from enjoying the kingdom life, Sister Tamara, because of dishonor. And I'm not talking about just necessarily dishonoring the men and women of God. I'm talking about dishonoring God. I ain't going to go deeper with that today. But we, we got we to check ourselves. How do we represent him? And the kingdom. How? Are we sloppy? I bet you if you go downstairs and and, and where the children being taught, I bet they being taught with excellence. Minister Kenny seeks the Lord to take his time and put the curriculum together for for this teachers to teach. I bet you that some of the stuff he be telling me, they I'll be wanting to go to children's church. And them babies come up here excited. They know it. They know. They learning. He ain't just down there with, let's just babysit them and give them some pizza until their parents get out of there. No. He doing it as unto the Lord. Because I believe if you can teach a baby, you will be qualified to teach the people. Everything that's within us. We have to do it unto the Lord. You know when stuff sloppy, y'all. Y'all know when stuff out of it, it, it's out of place. It's out of place. You be like that don't belong here. So, Terry, can I talk to you? Okay. So we were in Dillard's yesterday, right? And so I was getting some cologne, and so the, I noticed the young lady was sharp who was helping me, but I happened to look down. She had on bedroom shoes. My hand to God. I say, unless she had some feet surgery or something. I don't know the whole story. But it threw me off, Sister Dorothy. I was like. I know that wasn't a new outfit because nobody else. Brother Eric, nobody else had bedroom shoes on. Everybody else. Was, I was like, hold on. Am, am I missing something? I, I just, it, but it was obvious. Because it was excellence until you dropped down. You think people don't notice how we represent the kingdom. Listen, if you have a certain expectation for dealers, for belts, some of y'all like needless markup. But I just say Nordstrom instead of Neiman Marcus. But, but, if, but listen, when, when we go in certain places, I've I never been in Louis Vuitton and they never been around shoes on. You ain't got, you know, and they all look the same. They all dressed in their black. They they look like ushers. How can I help you? How can I serve? Would you like some 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 water or some tea or some wine? Just bring me some water. (laughs) 
some of that sparkling water I like. <laughs> Y'all, <laughs> coach ain't never offered me nothing. <laughs> it, ain't, it ain't offered me anything. It's like, is this all? <laughs> Listen, I'm not trying to be facetious. I'm trying to show you. There, there are certain expectations that you have in certain environments. When, when people come into the church, when they come into the kingdom, do we have bedroom shoes on? No, I'm not. Uh-uh. Y- y'all answer too quick. I'm talking about spiritually. <laughs> now, some of you might have them on in the nature. But I'm talking, I'm talking do, are we walking around with spiritual bedroom shoes on and people saying, man, something out of place. That just don't fit. They saying they represent the kingdom. Kingdoms are excellent. Kings will have you killed if you misrepresented them. Y'all remember when, um, when, when Saul and Jonathan was killed, when Saul killed himself, and the young man came, and he t- tried to be big in David's eyes and say, yeah, oh, Saul told me to kill him. You know, he was wounded, and I killed him. And David said, you did what? You killed the king? He thought David was going to be happy because he knew that, that Saul was trying to kill David. David took him out because you, you disrespected the kingdom. Because there's a protocol. There's an order. And if we expect that when we go in certain natural places, you know, there's certain restaurants you can't even get no crumbs on the table. They come by and, and, and sweep it off and, all right, back at it. Every time you get a little bit on there coming cloud, like they're getting on my nerves. Just let me eat. <laughs> but it, it's a certain, it's a certain protocol. Well, the kingdom of God is higher than Dale Frisco's. It is higher than Chima's. It, it is higher than these fancy places. And we want to do it raggedy. We want to drag in the God's house. We want to be pumped to worship. Why? Why is that? Because our focus is broken. The songs say, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full, right, in his wonderful face. Oh, y'all don't know the old stuff. I'm sorry. Okay. Turn your eyes upon him. That means I'm looking at something else if I got to turn my eyes upon him. That means my focus has been broken. My eyes should stay on him, the author, and looking unto him, the author and the finisher of my faith. That's like you shouldn't be putting your armor on every day. You should never take it off. Why are you getting up putting on armor every day? You should have, keep your armor on. You, the, your greatest vulnerability is when you sleep. Okay, I, y'all will get that next week. So the Lord is going to repay us, right? Yes. Last scripture, Luke 9, 23, and I close with this. I'm reading this from the Amplified, so you can just write this down. This is the, the new Amplified, and it's talking about Yeshua. And he was saying to them all, if anyone wishes to follow me, how many here want to follow him? If anyone wishes to follow me, as my disciple or learned one, He must deny himself. The first prerequisite for following him is to deny yourself. You can't truly be a disciple without denial. I don't don't know what's going on up in here today. The hokey pokey is necessary. Do the hokey pokey. Denial of oneself is the price for discipleship. You know, it's a lot of churches got discipleship classes now. I don't know why. Because the people sitting up in there hadn't denied themselves. Let me, let me finish reading this. He must deny himself. Listen to what that means. Set aside selfish interests. Say set aside. Set aside. Selfish interests. Selfish interest. And take up his cross daily. Listen. I, I know for years I've heard this scripture, take up your cross daily. Take up, see, we, we said take up his cross. 
Anybody else heard that? Take up his, that's not what it says. It says take up your cross. What does it mean take up my cross? I ain't died on no cross. Exactly. That's the problem. Taking up your cross means dying to the things that once brought you pleasure. When you take up your cross, there is a crucifixion taking place daily. Paul said, I die daily. He didn't say I died when I said come into my heart. He said I die daily, meaning there's a daily death. Every day you should be dying to something. Nobody is sinless. Well, they might not, but they should be sinning less. Why? Because I'm, uh, I am dying daily. So I am, how can I say this? I don't, that don't sound right how I'm hearing it. I am more deceased. I'll take a more dead than sound right. I am more deceased today than I was yesterday. If I'm dying daily, meaning that I am deader, right? <laughs> I am deader today than I was yesterday. And tomorrow I will be deader than I was today. I am dying daily. That means I am taking up my cross daily. I'm dying to something. I graduated from the cussing you out. I done died today. Now I got to die to roll my eyes at you. Now I got to die to gossip. I'm just saying what people are dealing with. Now, now you got to die to gossip. Now you got to die to having stuff in your heart toward people. Now you got to die to lying. Because you know church people lie. Now I got to die to robbing God. Now I got, you die daily. You ain't arrived. I don't care how annoying that you are. Let somebody rub you the wrong way and see if you really did. If you take one earring off, well, no, Lord. No, you took it off. It's, it's still in there. This guy did something in the store. He walked right in front of me, did something. You remember that baby the other day and you looked at me? And you was like, what you say you delivered? Or something. You're like, you're delivered. Because I, I know the old me would have took pleasure. The old me would have took pleasure. Like, man, what's up? You, you don't see me? But I ain't say anything. I just smile. Because to live is Christ. To die is the game. The old man dead. You know, the old me dead. He ain't never coming back. <laughs> You, you got to make sure you're dying daily. I mean, what would it have profit for me to confront him and I'm the pastor? It would have got to the news or something. And he's a pastor up in Kannapolis and he was in here choking this man out. <laughs> and y'all would have been, see, I knew he wasn't all that. <laughs> daily. He, let me finish reading this. I thought I was finished. He said, take up his cross daily. Listen to what that entails. Expressing a willingness to endure whatever may come. Expressing a willingness to endure whatever may come and follow me. Then believing in me, conforming to my example in living, and if need be, suffering or perhaps dying because of faith in me. That's a lot, y'all. That's just to be a disciple. Expressing a, will a willingness to endure whatever may come. Can you endure your flesh crying out? Can you endure people talking about you? Can you endure people in your church that know you know you you know they don't like you, but you still speak and love them anyway? Can you endure this all this even to suffering, even to the point that you might have to lose your life? That's what you have to consider to become a disciple. Because if you consider that, you didn't come into this blind. 
And if you didn't come into this blind, you know you got to keep your focus on him. I ain't even going to get into my next part. Next part is focus requires a different mindset. What kind of mind do you need to stay focused? Y'all, he, it has to be the priority. Listen, when, when, when bodybuilders are training to compete, they get on strict diets. They get on strict diets. Sometimes they load up with carbs. Sometimes they don't have carbs. They, they, they strict diet because they need their, their body to look a certain type of way. So they, they, they pay the price in order. They have a focus of the trophy. They pay the price, whatever they need to do to look a certain way. We got to do what we need to do to make sure we're focused and that we are accomplishing what he needs us to accomplish, y'all. So too many of us taking this responsibility too lightly. It, it requires... Think about how an actor can get a certain role and they can lose 30 or 40 pounds to play that role. And then after it's finished, they'll put the weight. Look how Jamie Foxx bulked up to play Mike Tyson in the gym every day. It looked just like the young Mike Tyson. Guns every day. They take it serious. They're focused. But the church, we won't stay focused, y'all. It, see, that, their careers is their priority. Whatever they do, if I got to look like an AIDS patient, I'll lose 40 pounds. That's what they do. What, the movie Philadelphia, he had to lose all the weight because he's supposed to have AIDS. They, they do whatever it takes. They have it. Do we have it? Will Smith, the play Ali, bulked up. Then when it was over, he lost it. Focus. The church, if, think about it. If we could develop that kind of focus, y'all, we would be unstoppable. Amen. It's kingdom investment time. Minister Jamel is coming.